Next talk will be by David Simons from the Royal Veterinary College. Hi, um, good morning, thank you for having me here. I'm delighted to talk about some work that we're doing as part of my PhD. Um, and what I'm planning on doing is introducing the system that we're working on. So it's a rodent zoonotic disease called Lassa fever. And how I hope that the work that we're conducting will help us understand better the complexity of this disease system. Uh, the component that I'm going to be talking about is the rodent trapping studies, which are ongoing in Sierra Leone. Um, and we're particularly interested in how this can help us understand the dynamic changes that are occurring to the hazard of disease risk across that space under changing settings of host and human contact, for example, through modifications in land use, um, climate disturbance, and invasive rodent species. This work is supported by the Pandora Consortium, which is a network of universities across Europe and Africa. Um, and I'd like to also just echo the comments that um, Amira made this morning about interdisciplinary working. So I'm a medical doctor by training, and I have supervisors from veterinary medicine, clinical medicine, and ecology. And I think this sort of One Health approach is really fantastic. Um, and this work would not have been possible at all without our collaborators in Sierra Leone, based at Njali University and Kenema uh, Government Hospital. So just first to speak about the disease itself. So Lassa fever is a rodent-borne virohemorrhagic fever that spills over into human populations. And the WHO have identified it as being endemic in four countries across the region, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Liberia. However, cases have been reported from six other countries. Um, and cases are also exported. Uh, so most recently in March of this year, um, a case from Mali was exported into the UK, sort of really demonstrating that this can become a global problem. And because of that, the WHO have declared this uh, disease that uh, is on a watch list for pandemic, pro pandemic potential, and there's uh, ongoing work to better understand its epidemiology and develop vaccines against it. So I'd like to just briefly mention the um, the reservoir ecology. Um, so the primary uh, host is uh, called Mastemis natalensis, the multi mammoth rat. Um, and this is distributed across much of sub-Saharan Africa. However, 10 other rodent species have also been detected to um, either be acutely infected with Lassa fever or to have evidence of antibodies against it. And the order that they're listed here is just in sort of the prevalence from some of the studies that have identified that. Something that is quite interesting about this dynamic is uh, shown on the, uh, the map on the right. And the different colors represent the different clades of Mastemis natalensis. However, um, Lassa mammarina virus is very much limited to those blue dots, the westernmost clade, um, which is the A1 clade of uh, Mastemis natalensis. The, the reason for that isn't clearly known. However, there are other arena viruses that occur elsewhere in its distribution. Uh, and moving on to the disease itself, so this is data from Nigeria where um, the epidemiology is sort of best understood. And what we've observed, or what we observe, is that you get these epidemic outbreaks. So typically in the first three months of the year, the number of spillover events into human populations is relatively higher. Um, and there's very limited human to human transmission. So most of these are um, infection events from rodent sources. Uh, however, the rest of the year there are sporadic spillover, but not to the same extent. Um, several factors have been proposed as uh, causing these patterns, and one of which is sort of rainfall or changes in rodent abundance in these areas. So there's been some recent work uh, conducted by Bozinski at the University of Idaho, and um, they were modeling the distribution of the risk of uh, Lassa fever infection in human populations by combining the distribution of the rodent host, uh, Massimus natalensis, and the uh, suspected distribution of the virus using seroprevalence studies in humans. Um, and what they did is that they estimated that cases could be anywhere up to 900,000 a year, which is nearly twice that uh, currently uh, understood uh, by the WHO and others. Um, and they found that the true distribution may be much greater uh, than previously thought. So significant numbers of cases potentially being undetected in Ghana and the Ivory Coast, for example. However, there is significant spatial heterogeneity across this range. Some other work conducted by uh, Reading et al, based at UCL, 
um, explored the potential changes of the viral um, distribution under different scenarios. So the top figure A shows the, their modeled range of the current, um, the current range of the virus. So pre predominantly limited to Nigeria, but also around uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia. Um, and in figure B, they've used a model that includes uh, expected changes under the RCP scenario 6.5, which is the future sort of climate change scenario, where it shows a dramatic expansion in the range of the virus. So including further areas in northern Nigeria, but also um, across much of West Africa. Uh, however, neither of the two models that I've just talked about previously um, explicitly explore the effects of changing rodent species interactions across this region. Um, which are being driven by land use pressure changes and competitive exclusion, uh, particularly from rodents that are currently invasive. So our work is focused in Sierra Leone. Uh, I just want to give a bit of context within the country. So since the 1970s, Sierra Leone has undergone some very dramatic events. Uh, there was a civil war followed by the um, Ebola outbreak in 2014. And alongside this, there's significant demographic changes in the country. So there's a median age of less than 20, there's a population boom, and this is leading to intensive agricultural intensification across much of the landscape. So the satellite imagery uh, rotating through on the right are showing land use change uh, that's been occurring since the late 70s. So as purple and green areas are being replaced by yellow, this is evidence that um, increased land is being used for farming. And this, uh, is compared on the left with um, locations from which Lassa fever has been reported. So most of the Lassa fever cases um, and sort of evidence of uh, infection through seroprevalence studies has been done in the eastern province of Sierra Leone. So the current study has been designed to inform whether we can better understand the risk of zoonotic spillover by characterizing these rodent species assemblages and investigating their structure across space, across different habitats, and through time. So we're sort of following on from some of the work that's been done by Keesing, Osfield, uh, among others, um, thinking about the sort of dilution effects and sort of how diseases uh, can become more prevalent under changing uh, host sort of structures. And we're trying to adopt a zoonotic host diversity and abundance structure, which we feel is more uh, reflective of the true okay, So rather than having a single species spillover paradigm, we're thinking about how these species interact within this space. So I just want to talk now about our study itself. So we've um, set up uh, our trapping activity within four villages in the eastern province. So the first is Lalihun, which is a village of around 1,500 people near the mining districts north of Kenema. Uh, and then we have Salama, which is a smaller village of around 100 people, 200 people, uh, in a more rural setting, surrounded by plantations and uh, relatively unaffected forest. Then we have Lambiama, which is on the outskirts of Kenema, a rapidly growing city in the district of around 200,000 people, which um, historically was its own village, sort of very separate, but is now being swallowed up into this sort of urban sprawl. And we have Bayama, which is um, towards Bo, but also relatively rural. And within each of these village sites, we've set up seven trapping locations in different habitats. Um, each point on the map represents a single trap that we've geolocated in that space. And we're capturing across a um, habitat gradient, including agricultural settings, um, forests, and then also within human villages and houses. So, so far, we're about halfway through our planned activity. We've got a year's worth of data, and that's around 26,000 trap nights. And the blue bars on this um, figure just represent the rainy season. So we're trying to see if we can measure how these populations may be changing over time and through seasons. So some initial results. So we've um, trapped around 450 rodents um, from 13 different genera of uh, shrews and uh, murids. The most common rodents that we're trapping are those that we believe are in involved in this Lassa virus uh, sort of transmission chain. So Mastomis uh, natalensis being the predominant one, but also Prowmis. Um, and we found that the rodents were being trapped in different locations, different habitat types, but actually this was quite heterogeneous across our study sites. So for example, I'll pick out just Lambiama where Moose musculus was sort of dominant and we've trapped very little mastomis species within those houses. Uh, the opposite was the case in Bayama and Salama, suggesting that there's quite a lot of heterogeneity across this region. 
And we can really sort of focus that down by using our geolocated trapping data um, to be able to see this sort of competitive exclusion or this potential competitive exclusion in practice where master mist is really not present in the areas that we're seeing moose. So these are just for two of the villages that we've trapped in. So another way to sort of interpret this is by looking at something similar to contact matrices where we've um, plotted the... So what we did is around each rodent that we trapped, we identified their potential range from the literature and drew a, a spatial buffer around it and then co-located other individuals from different genera within that space. And what we can see from this early data is that uh, mastermists are fairly commonly co-located with other mastermists individuals, but less so with uh, moose musculus, sort of the commensal invasive house mouse. Um, and that's less the case for ratus ratus. Um, and then this is where we split it out across different habitat types. I'm very sorry for the small text, but I've put the arrows there to try and make it a little bit more interpretable. So the red arrows relate to mastermiss, not a, well, mastermiss species, and the pale blue arrows are moose species. And we can see that while there is some interaction within the village settings, as we move further away from areas of human habitation, there's less contact between these. And I think that this is very important when we're trying to consider the true risk of... Um, the expansion of Lassa fever across this space under different changing conditions where we expect moose musculus to continue to invade, particularly among urban settings. And that might go some way to explain why Lassa fever is currently seen as a disease of sort of the rural populations when we don't really see outbreaks within cities. So this is all still very preliminary work. We've got quite a, li a lot more to do to be able to understand the true distribution of these uh, individual species across the studied region. And then we're combining that with some lab work that I'm heading off to see earlier and to do once I leave this conference, where we're going to be able to look for antibodies against Lassa fever and see if we can then combine these two different sources of information to uh, produce a model of risk of uh, pathogen spillover into human populations. Um, as I say, this, this work would just not be possible without our, our field team. So some of them are smiling for these photos here, um, but they've been you know, fantastic help to me. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to finish there and invite any questions. <laughs> Terrific, what, what questions are there for David? Someone's working their way up. Hello, great talk. Uh, just one question. Do you think there's a possibility, I guess, for an intermediate vector, like a flea or mosquito or something like that, that can affect your data or something like that? Um, so there's not been much evidence for that for this virus, but there definitely in other systems that sort of share these sorts of... Uh, different interacting rodent species, that can definitely be the case. Uh, with Lassa, a lot of the lab work has shown that the, the rodent hosts are very sort of um, susceptible and that's sort of where the transmission routes come from. I'm, I'm not sure how much people have looked into sort of tick-borne sort of interactions between them or mosquitoes, but I haven't seen any evidence for it. Thank you. Thanks, nice talk. I was curious if there's good data to quantify the relative infectiousness of different uh, rodent species in this case, or is the effect of uh, the rodents on mastomies primarily through their interactions or direct land use changes? So the, um, the evidence for the infectiousness of the individual species has only really been conducted for Massimus natalensis. So that's the one that's really been considered the true reservoir species. So there's been lots of laboratory sort of based work um, where they've been able to assess the sort of the virulence from a uh, virus sort of replicating within there. There's been very little work on any of the other species. Um, a lot of it's been thought that these are just incidental sort of findings from rodents that may have been in close contact with infected individuals, but really there's no understanding of any potential contribution that they're making to the transmission dynamics in the area. So that's one of the things that we'd like to do by sort of assessing this as an as assemblage, sort of as a, a wider sort of species interacting system rather than just focusing on a single species. Last question from the online okay. participants. Uh, we have one from an anonymous Zoom attendee. Um, can you talk more about how contact networks were constructed, how the contact networks were constructed, and how different trapping success was controlled for between habitats? Mm -hmm. um, so firstly, these, the contact networks are relatively crude. So we have where a rodent was trapped, we have that geolocated. 
and using evidence from the literature about sort of how much these individual species may be moving in search of foraging for food, we can draw buffers around them. So we place the buffer relative to that species or genus around that rodent and then identified others that were falling within that space um, and then looked at the probability of it being one compared to a different one. So it's a relative sort of contact network, so it's dependent on the number of what rodents that were trapped in that space, and then we tried to split that out over habitats. Um, it, it, it's a very, as I say, it's a very crude metric because that's where we trapped the rodent. It doesn't mean that's where it was spending most of its time. It doesn't mean that it hadn't migrated there from elsewhere. So this is really sort of, as I say, quite a preliminary approach and quite an early step. Um, and then the next part of the question was, I've forgotten, sorry. <laughs> oh, yes. So um, the trapping success varied by different habitat type so, and also between the villages. So we were getting much greater tra trapping success within households, um, which is quite common from the literature in rodent trapping. Um, but what we aim to do is that we aim to keep our trapping effort consistent across spaces. I've been in subsequent discussions with other rodent people that say that perhaps we should have been modifying our trapping effort by the, uh, the type of habitat that we were trapping, but that just wasn't part of how we designed the study. Yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you.